Then they took Jesus to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered Pilate by saying, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Take him yourself and judge him according to your laws. They responded, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. Then Pilate entered the headquarters and summoned Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? I am not a Jew, am I? Your own chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the authorities. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So you are a king then? Well, you say that I am king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is the truth? After he had said this, Pilate went out to the Jewish leaders again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? The crowd screamed, not this man, Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a violent political rebel. When Pilate heard what the crowd said, he took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers there wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him on the face. Look, look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against this man. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Here is the man. The crowd cried even louder, Crucify him! Crucify him! Take him yourself and crucify him. I find no case against him. But members of the crowd hollered out, We have a law that says he should die. He claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. And therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of the greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jewish leaders cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench. It was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Here is your king. They shouted back, Away with him! Crucify him! Shall I crucify your king? They responded, Our only king is Caesar. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified.
So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went up to Golgotha, the place of the skull. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate had an inscription put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. After the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to her, Woman, there is your son. And Jesus said to his disciple, And there is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, knowing all that was now finished, and in order to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I thirst. One of the soldiers took a sponge full of sour wine and held it to his mouth. Then he said, It is accomplished. Then he bowed his head and handed over his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the cross. During the Sabbath, so they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the men who had been crucified with him. And when they came to Jesus, and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and that once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. 
His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a secret disciple of Jesus, because of his fear of the Jewish authorities, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed Jesus' body. Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came with Joseph, bringing a very large mixture of myrrh and aloes. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where Jesus was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been buried. Because it was a Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now, the problem with today, Good Friday, is that sometimes we forget the power of the cross because we forget the cruelty of crucifixion. Oh, we wear the cross as a little pendant. I have one, 14 karat gold from Italy, I wear. Some people wear them as an earring. If you go to Hobby Lobby, you'll see beautiful crosses that are very decorative, put it in your house or next to your big screen TV, whatever you want. Our crosses, we make them of gold or brass or some kind of precious metal, carved wood. Sometimes we forget the power of the cross and the cruelty of crucifixion. Uh, the blessed Lord didn't only die of suffocating on the cross, asphyxiation, he couldn't breathe, he also bled out because of the Roman nails that pierced his hands and feet. And our Lord wasn't crucified like in those movies at Easter time on a beautiful mountaintop with the blue sky behind him, only three crosses. No, there were probably many crosses. It was just outside the wall of Jerusalem. It was part of a landfill. It was a dump. And the thousands of people who were there for Passover could see him. He didn't wear a white cloth. Or the, we did that because we're very, you know, respectful. They were crucified stark naked, added to their humiliation. So the cross and the cruelty of crucifixion, let's not forget it. It's not a pretty thing. 
even though in our churches or in our home, we usually have beautiful crosses and crucifixes. The only reason we honor the cross today and we hold it up in a few minutes to venerate it is because Jesus didn't stay in the grave. We do believe and we know that by the power of God, he was raised up in the awesome beauty of that resurrection. That's the only reason we're here today. That's the only reason in a little while, even on Good Friday, we'll take Holy Communion, though not a Mass, but the risen Lord is present. So we will meet Christ in communion in a little while. But don't ever forget the power and the cruelty of crucifixion and the cross. The Romans made it perfect. They got it right. Nobody survived crucifixion. They were masters of it. The whole ancient world lived in dread and fear of crucifixion. It was the worst thing that could happen. The famous Roman writer, Cicero, who was known for his beautiful writing, his poetry, Cicero, he tried to describe a crucifixion in Latin, of course, and he said, I can't do it. It's such a horrible thing. He invented the word excruciating, excrucis, from the cross. You get a headache, a migraine, your knee hurts. If it's really bad, what do we say? I, doctor, I got excruciating pain. I can't even describe it. Cicero invented that word. He was talking about a crucifixion. So on this Good Friday, don't forget the power and the cruelty of what happened to Jesus. Now there's two things that the cross does. One thing, it's a judgment on us. Whenever we see a cross with Jesus upon it, a crucifix, it reminds us that, you know, in many ways we're judged because our human nature, we're not that much different from those people on Palm Sunday. One day they said, hooray for Jesus, Hosanna. A couple days later they said, crucify him. We're like that, aren't we, sometimes? Even in our relationship with God, sometimes we're, we're so intense. We love you, Lord. Let something go wrong. Other days we say, oh, forget about it. You know, we turn our back even on God. So the cross, when we see it, is a judgment on our fickle human nature. Never forget it. Somebody said, you know, if Jesus came among us today, we might take his life. Oh, I don't know if we'd execute him, hang him or lynch him or send him to the electric chair or the gas chamber, but we'd probably just be indifferent. Someone preaching, turn the other cheek, love your enemies. We might just ignore them. A lot of people today in, this, in our city, a lot of my friends and relatives and yours, they're doing that. They're, they're indifferent. <laughs> they don't want to kill Jesus. They just ignore him. They live their lives as if our Lord never came among us. They're not here. The place should be filled. The other thing that the cross does is that it kind of sticks it in the face of the worldly powers. You know, people think that the world, well, we have, we have weapons, we have computers, we, have, we go to the moon, you know, and the cross says, wait a minute, God is more powerful than any power in the world. The cross taunts, you know, taunts, it's a great word, it sticks it right in the eye of the world. The cross says God is more powerful because God raised up the crucified one. I'm reminded, you might remember, in 1979, St. Pope John Paul II, who's a saint now, the great Polish Pope, 1979, he went to his home country, Poland. There were a million people in the square in Warsaw, and the atheistic Russian communists were ruling the roost, and they were sitting back there with all their nuclear weapons and army tanks, and they were vicious toward the Polish people like they are right now toward Ukraine, and Pope John Paul II visited there, and there were a million people in the square, and there was a huge cross, it was like 50 feet high behind him. 
looming over the whole scene. And they said the Russian officials were shaking in their boots. And the people said, I can't speak Polish. I speak Italian, though. But the Polish people, for 20 minutes, they chanted, we want God. We want God. And that cross right over the whole scene. Not too long after the Russian Empire collapsed, communism, the Soviet way. Remember, the wall came down, and that was the end of that. Another time, in the 1920s, I don't, a lot of people forget this. In the 1920s, for a while in Mexico, there was a government, a regime that was atheistic, and they shot priests and nuns, burned down churches and chapels, closed Catholic schools. For a few years in the 1920s, Mexico, they persecuted Catholic religion. And there was a priest by the name of Padre Miguel Michael, Pro, P-R-O. And they captured him, put him against the wall to shoot him. And that priest, Padre Paul, Pro, at the last minute, he put out his arms like a cross. He said, Vivo Cristo Rey. What's that mean? Long live Christ the King. And they shot him. But the power of the cross he made with his arms, unbelievable. And they had filmed it, made a movie to show off what they did, they said many hearts and souls he won over. They're thinking of making him a saint now. So the power of the cross, it says to the powers of the world, sticks it right in their face, you know, says God is even more powerful than death's hold over us. I was talking to a woman a few weeks ago. She said, Father, I forgot where it was. I was probably out some night, you know. And this, the woman said, I love my Catholic faith. It's like a bed of roses. I find pardon, peace, security, mercy. I like a bed of roses, my faith. And I said, well, you got a bed of roses. But remember, <laughs> where there's roses, there's thorns. Somebody had to wear a crown of thorns for your faith. So we honor the cross in a few moments, it'll be held before your eyes to venerate it, to bless you with it. The cross is the altar for the Lamb of God. The cross is really the throne for Christ the King. The cross is the pulpit that our blessed Lord used at the end. That's where he said those words from, the pulpit of the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Spirit. <laughs> Please remain seated as we pray the great intercession of the Church. Jesus lived and died as one of us. He made earth holy. He made our time sacred. In this afternoon, we pray these great intercessions, along with Pope Francis and with every member of our faith in every language and every place throughout this world. We pray for Pope Francis, all bishops, and the progress of the Synod throughout the world. May God guide and inspire the church with vision, courage, and strength. May the words and the actions of the church influence justice and peace in every place, that the world may become one, made one, united as a human family. Let us pray to the Lord. Crucify, Crucify Lord, receive our, our prayer. 
Let us pray for the entire world. We embrace those who suffer and who are stripped of human dignity. For the people of Syria, Libya, Yemen, Somalia, Afghanistan, Myanmar, Sudan, South Sudan, Central America, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Republic of Congo, and Ukraine. For refugees and victims in any country where human rights are neglected and people are abused. For every nation, including our own, where people are made victims by tyranny or violence, terrorism, inhospitality, shape us into a holy people living together in this sacred earth, honoring God's spirit in every person. Let us pray to the Lord. For the unity of all Christians, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, Evangelical, and Fundamentalist churches, may we have broader dialogue and a deeper understanding of each other. Lead us together toward peace and unity, that we may become that seamless garment that clothes the body of the risen Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Crucify, Lord, receive our prayer. Let us pray for all who believe in God through the great world religions, for Christians, Jews, and Muslims who believe in one God and strive to live according to God's will. For those who embrace the Hindu path of karma, the Buddhist quest for enlightenment, the wisdom of the Far East, the peace of the Baha'i. Spirit of God, weave threads of unity into the very tapestry of the world. May all people uphold the sacredness of our common holy places and the holiness of this entire planet. Let us pray to the Lord. Crucify, Lord, receive our prayer. Let us pray for all who find faith elusive, for those who only experience stumbling blocks with faith and with religion. And for all who have been hurt or disillusioned, judged or abandoned, or oppressed by the church or by any organized faith, may we, the channels of healing, welcome them with a tender human love. Let us pray to the Lord. Crucify, Lord, receive our prayer. Let us pray for the church through which we build and celebrate our faith, inspire clergy, deacons, religious, and lay ministers to lead by words and by example. May faith shape our lives and our decisions. May forgiveness heal our brokenness. For all who will be baptized, confirmed, receiving Eucharist communion for the first time, for those considering marriage or even ordination, for those who struggle in their relationship with the church, may faith sustain our journey all together. Let us pray to the Lord. Crucify, Lord, receive our prayer. We pray for those who work for the common good, in government, safety, health, medicine, research, or human development. 
for those who guide the stewardship of our planet and our environment. We remember all who are in special need, the sick, the dying, those who are lonely or abandoned, for prisoners, the hungry, the homeless, those who are addicted, for those who have a disease, and all who grieve or despair. May the threat of pandemic end in this world, and may we find strength and consolation, walking, walking together with those who are the crucified of our world today as one holy people graced by God's love. Let us pray to the Lord. Crucified Lord, receive our prayer. In our prayer this afternoon, we venerate the cross of Christ. In the cross of Christ, we behold all human suffering. We honor past and present martyrs of the church. We pray for all who are still persecuted. We venerate all God's children on the earth who suffer because of violence terrorism, abuse, indifference, or neglect. In the cross of Christ, we behold the prisoner, the hostage, the unwelcome immigrant, and the refugee. We remember all who are denied human dignity, health, or safety. In the cross of Christ, we behold the poor, the war-torn, the hungry, we embrace all who endure the pain of grief or despair. Please stand. places, we will venerate the cross of Christ from our pews. Please use this time in private veneration by lifting your personal prayers to the cross of Christ, from which we receive blessing and through which we find meaning for human pain. We behold the cross of Christ in the crosses we carry throughout life the crosses of our loving and our denials, the crossings of our misunderstandings and failures. We behold the blood of the cross on which all the people of the world. He
we behold the cross of Christ as one family, together in suffering and in pain, together on the pilgrim road of life. Even on Good Friday, though there is no Mass anywhere in the world, we do receive the Blessed Lord in our communion, the beautiful Eucharist consecrated at the evening Mass of the Lord's Supper last night. And when you come up for communion, if you do, at the foot of the sanctuary there are baskets. Those offerings go for the maintenance of the great shrines of the Holy Land in Bethlehem and Jerusalem and and Nazareth. Let's stand together offering that perfect prayer that our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Protect us in our body, mind, and spirit. Even free us from our sinful ways. Hold us back from what might be contrary to the gospel. Through Christ our Lord. Behold now the Lamb of God, and see the one who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, my soul shall be healed. May the body of Christ bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray, everyone. O oh God, you restore us to life by the triumphant death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Continue his healing work among us. May we who take part in this sacred mystery of our faith never cease to serve you. And we offer this blessing. Lord, send your abundant blessings upon this people who have with devotion recalled the death of Christ in the sure hope of sharing in a risen life. Give them pardon, bring them comfort. May their faith grow ever stronger and their salvation be assured through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may choose to spend time in, in silence at the crucifixion of veneration, at the tomb, or in your pew. If you are leaving, we ask that you remain silent until you have exited the church. Please respect those who wish to remain for a few more minutes in prayer. The church doors will remain open for 30 minutes. Please do not touch or kiss statues or the crucifix in order to maintain sanitary conditions. Thank you. Yeah. 